Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. And I'd like to welcome you to episode 288 of the FCPA Compliance Report. The FCPA Compliance Report is sponsored by the Red Flag Group. The Red Flag Group is a business advisory, information services, and technological firm that helps corporations, financial institutions, government, and SMEs to manage their integrity and compliance in their business and their third parties. You can garner more information on the Red Flag Group by checking out their website, www.redflaggroup.com. So what does stakeholder engagement mean in the 21st century? How has this topic gained such traction over the past few years? What is the role of the compliance professional in stakeholder engagement? How does increased stakeholder engagement help to make companies stronger, more efficient, and most critically, more profitable? In today's episode, I explore some of these questions and more with Allison Taylor. Allison is the Director of Advisory Services at BSR.org. And she and Sarah Enright co-authored a research report entitled The Future of Stakeholder Engagement, subtitled Business Leadership for an Inclusive Economy. In this podcast, Allison walks us through what the uh, three components of the report include, which are the five drivers of change in stakeholder engagement, how you might rethink stakeholder engagement in a, on a theoretical basis, and then new approaches to meet emerging challenges where she lays out practical things that you can do to increase stakeholder engagement. It's really a fascinating interview. For the compliance professional, I think it's going to be particularly important because I think CSR is going to move into and perhaps even merge with compliance, certainly in the stakeholder engagement that Ms. Taylor is advocating through her research report. There will be lots of business partners, alliances, and strategic pairing ups by corporations to increase stakeholder engagement. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you very much for listening to the FCPA Compliance Report. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. Today, I have back with me Allison Taylor. She's the Director of Advisory Services at BSR. She is now a personal friend of mine, as we met last week at the FCPA blog New York City Conference. So I can say that we have now shaken each other's hand. Uh, but before that uh, meeting, precipitous meeting, or propitious meeting, I should say, she had uh, agreed to um, come on the podcast to talk about what I think is an exciting new research report from BSR that you participated in. It's entitled The Future of Stakeholder Engagement. So with that somewhat long-winded introduction, welcome. Thank you very much, Tom. I'm delighted to be here as always, and thank you for having me back. So I sat and read this today, Allison, in preparation for this podcast, and frankly, I was just um, so inspired and enthused by what you guys put together that uh, I've written a, a, a minimum two-series blog post, and I may expand it to three on this research report. But uh, since you're one oh, of the yeah. authors, I really wanted to uh, kind of take a little bit of a deep dive into uh, some of it. It really got me thinking about how to rethink uh, from a new perspective stakeholder engagement really for the, for the new millennium. And so what uh, spurred you guys to, to do the research and to write this uh, research report? Sure, Tom. Well, thank you for um, having me. So I think, first of all, um, what spurred me is that stakeholder engagement, it's a term used a lot in the CSR sustainability space. Um, I think people very often don't really know what it means. And I think it has become, in many cases, a process that companies do for the sake of doing it. So they know they can't just think about their shareholders. They know they have to engage with the wider world. And they maybe have a conversation once a year with um, some socially responsible investors and some NGOs. And then they don't really know what to do with it. And I think what we see at BSR is that the world is really changing. Um, there are a lot of macro trends, uh, arguably a crisis in business ethics. I think we can see that all over the world from Wells Fargo to Petrobras to any number of other examples. 
And I think companies are thinking about um, their relationship with the wider world and to some degree at least moving from an exclusive focus on short-term shareholder value to understanding their reputations and their stakeholders in a lot more detail. And this is obviously interesting from a corruption perspective, among other things. But um, a lot of companies have yet to sort of move to the next level of using this input and using this feeling that they ought to do something in ways that are actually useful to business strategy. And so what we've tried to do in this report is look at the forces that we think are going to really transform stakeholder engagement and then provide some ideas for companies that want to do something really, really exciting here and hopefully transform their own reputations in the process. You know, I really appreciate the last sentence because I felt like it encapsulated almost everything you put in the report because you really lay out, here's the issue, but here's some solutions. And the one thing that you didn't say uh, just then, but you say in the report, and I really try to emphasize in my blog post is, guys, this will make you a more efficient and more profitable business. This is not uh, where where you started off, you know, perhaps this was a CSR initiative that we just talked to people about. But the way you guys laid it out, Allison, I really look, took this as a roadmap to how to make the business run uh, more efficiently and at the end of the day more profitably. So I really see what you guys have laid out as as the business or at least a business solution. And I think that's what really intrigued me about this. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. And I think, um, you know, we've seen very clearly the limits to an exclusive focus on sh uh, shareholder value, um, that a lot of time those short-term targets and so on, we've heard this in the corruption space, encourage businesses to be unethical. We're seeing maybe the limits of compliance processes and we're looking a lot more at culture and we're looking a lot more at reputation. And so, um, and then the, the other thing I think we're seeing that's very profound is, is disruption. So all over the world, uh, industries are getting disrupted. The incumbents are getting chucked out by these startup businesses out of Silicon Valley. And so I'm also saying that understanding your stakeholders is a way of understanding how your environment is changing and anticipating that. Um, and that's really why we, we start by looking at these macro trends, because we're saying that the world is transforming. Um, there are five different trends that will really change the way business is conducted and that stakeholder engagement or thinking about your stakeholders in a very systematic way can not only increase your, your shareholder value, but it can make you uh, sustainable over the long term and it can actually increase your profits and revenue as well. So um, I think it's really powerful and I think many of the questions are about how best to do it and we try and answer that in this report. We hit upon the, what uh, we, I wanted to start with in part one, which is where you examine the forces that are challenging companies to evolve in the current state of play. So why don't you go through the five uh, issues that you guys identified? Sure, and I'll try and be brief because there's a lot in all of them. But um, one, obviously, is is this idea of kind of hyper-transparency and obviously talking about the growth of the Internet's not new. But I think what we've, what we've seen is that um, issues that would before have been a sort of very uh, micro-local crisis can kind of really blow up to be global reputational problems. And so the links between... And stakeholders don't need to kind of talk to each other for this to happen because this can happen on the internet. Things can go viral. Um, conversations can get shaped. Um, and, and, and company reputations can get destroyed. So there's an idea in here that you can't control your reputation by controlling what information you give out anymore. We've obviously also seen these giant data leaks with Edward Snowden and the Panama Papers and others. So an idea that companies have to be really responsible in real time um, or um, they, they are not going to succeed. 
Um, the second trend is, is about a growth in individual empowerment. So we've seen a huge growth in the numbers of the middle class. I think this partly explains the big popular focus on corruption at the moment in countries all over the world, including the US, Brazil, China, Turkey, Russia, etc. So I think people increasingly looking at what government and business is doing and how government and business is working or not to fulfill human rights and transparency and their individual aspirations. Um, the third uh, trend we're seeing, I, we call the demographic shift in the automation of work. And this is really a combination of two things. One is that the world is getting much, much older. Um, and so the ability of workers to, um, to uh, take advantage of social services or rather the need of an aging population for social services is growing at the same time as we've got this kind of automation and a lot of jobs being lost through automation. So companies maybe will have less need for workers over the long term um, and will have to explore their ability to provide social benefits in, in other ways. Um, the fourth trend we've got is kind of environmental damage and climate change and um, conflict and contests around, for example, things like the use of water. If you look at conflict in the Middle East, it's quite interesting how um, much that lines up with water shortages. So I think we can see kind of climate change and environmental justice and responsibility coming up the public agenda as well. And then finally, um, with the Modern Slavery Act and the California Transparency Act and a lot of kind of legislative focus on the supply chain, um, I think company kind of responsibility over what the anti-corruption field calls third party risk, but uh, the CSR space calls supply chain sustainability is going to be a really big new focus of action and companies being held responsible for what goes on three, four tiers down in their supply chains, which is not very well covered either by supply chain audits or by anti-corruption compliance processes at the moment. So in summary, we think all these things are really going to transform the relationship between business and society and transform the field of ethics and compliance in the process. So let me just uh, give you sort of what each one of these issues brought up for me, because I really took where you guys started as a jumping off point and, and really tried to to use it as, as either a guidepost or maybe even a crystal ball. But so, for instance, in communication, connectivity, and hyper-transparency, number one, what, what I saw there is if you embrace all three of those, it, it can make your company more profitable because in large part, share price is based upon the trust people have in you. Not only trust to do business ethically, but also trust that you have a business plan uh, ready. So you have a plan A, you have a plan B, and heaven forbid you have to go to plan C, you have that plan C in place and you and you have those things and can demonstrate to a wide variety of stakeholders uh, by having hyper-transparency. On your um, individual empowerment in the middle class, really that drove home for me one of the um, things that have, has been sort of circulating, which is that freedom from corruption is now being seen as a human right. And by individual empowerment and the rise of the middle class, particularly in countries outside the United States, they are demanding uh, to be free from corruption at all levels. And certainly uh, that is driving, uh, I think, anti-corruption uh, enforcement across the globe. Frankly, I found your number three the most provocative but only because it was the most thought-provoking, uh, not that it was the most controversial, because if we are going to move to a more automated either manufacturing basis or some other type of uh, even a service-based economy that's uh, increasingly uh, automated, what is the responsibility of the corporation to um, provide for those who previously might have been employed uh, in, as individual employees? And that, I thought, was um, – I mean, that could be a whole paper by itself, but I was really fascinated uh, by that. On your primacy of climate change and water resources, what struck me there, Allison, was this, this was, to me, the single biggest point for 
communities as being stakeholders, meaning that businesses mm-hmm. need to understand that the communities they're in uh, are part of the stakeholders too, and being able to work with the communities. And at the end of the paper, you gave the example of um, an extractive uh, industry company that had worked with local communities, I think precisely on this point. So it really drove home for me the uh, the point on uh, communities as a stakeholder for businesses going forward. And then, of course, supply chain, you nail it right uh, on top of the head. Um, uh, I had interviewed a, a fellow Brit of yours, and at one point he said, I cannot believe in 2016 we're talking about slavery. You know, that was outlawed in the British Empire yeah. in 1837, and it's still a problem. And it's being addressed now, I think, properly by people not only like you and me, but businesses as well. And that's, I think, what will drive uh, part of the solution forward. So um, absolutely spot on on the supply chain as well. So I really enjoyed those points, but I found them very thought-provoking uh, and as a great way uh, really to lead – to part two, which is where you did a little bit of uh, stakeholder engagement theory. So why don't you walk us through that? Sure. And I um, I just wanted to pick up one, one thing, which is I think I've, I've just literally this afternoon come from presenting to our human rights working group on the links between human rights and corruption. And everyone in the room, and there were a lot of ethics and compliance officers, really engaged in that conversation and seeing those two fields, which have been weirdly sort of apart, coming more closely together around these issues. So absolutely think that's going to happen. Um, yeah, stakeholder theory, and there's a very good book um, Um, for those on the line interested by Edward Allen, really summarizing this. Um, But I think there's been a lot of confusion in the field of are we doing, are we engaging with stakeholders because it's the right thing to do from a human rights perspective, or are we engaging with stakeholders because it makes us more profitable and there's a business case for it. Um, And I think particularly the field has struggled with the business case because it's very easy to see um, how your shareholder value goes up and down and rather difficult to understand understand how um, making this work does improve your share price, but there's now a lot of research, um, some research say around the mining sector sort of saying that um, stakeholder engagement is actually more valuable than the minerals in the ground. So there's powerful research there sort of saying that if you can get this right, it really, really pays off. And I think we're arguing in the report It's not an either or. You can do this because it's the right thing to do. And I think the human rights perspective on corruption is incredibly powerful. But this will also make you more money and more successful and sustainable over the long term. So there is not a trade-off. An ethical business is profitable business. Absolutely. So uh, you had a great chart where you – which was entitled Making the Business Case – the value of stakeholder trust. And I was really intrigued by the points you raise entitled financial resilience, valuation, return on equity, reduction in costs and sales. And you go through and you don't just put sort of Allison's opinion on it or even Allison thinking about what Tom might think. You actually cited to academic and business studies to, to back up each one of these. And I think that every compliance officer listening to this needs to read. It's on page 14 and really needs to read it, but also look at your great footnotes here because you've cited to the studies. And this is the kind of academic presentation that a business person, a chief compliance officer, or even uh, any, any business leader can take and put in front of the board and say, look, this is the direction we're going. This is the direction valuation is going. This is where return on equity is going to increase because we're going to be able to reduce our cro- our costs and bump up our sales. So I really uh, appreciated this chart, not not just because it's Allison's opinion, because it's Allison's opinion based upon uh, some pretty significant research that uh, you guys followed through. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, this is always the question. It's the, it's the question around the anti-corruption compliance program, right? Is, is, is what's the business case? What's the, so, so everybody wants to kind of move these ideas about ethics and compliance beyond being seen as a cost in the business prevention department and being able to make the business case and say, if you get this right, guys, this is going to bring you not only a better reputation, which is still rather woolly, but it will have a direct impact 
impact on your bottom line and on your share price. And I think there's now a body of research demonstrating that very, very clearly. And as you've said, people can see this in the report. But we really believe that this idea of stakeholder trust is very, very powerful. Um, I think we're seeing a trend of, of, of ethics and compliance maybe um, – moving on as a field and much more of a focus on ethics and, and kind of moving beyond legal compliance. And I think this stakeholder-led approach provides one very practical way to make for people to make that happen. And so in part three, you lay out new approaches to meet these emerging challenges. And here is really uh, the operational part of uh, what you guys have, have written about. And you lay out some pretty concrete steps, I thought, that would allow a business leader, a chief compliance officer, or whomever at the corporation to think through and put into practice uh, examples of uh, stakeholder engagement or successful examples of stakeholder engagement. So you start off talking about um, collaboration for sy systemic change. Could you maybe just start there and, and walk us through that? Yeah, so that um, there's a lot of examples in the report um, where companies have really come together with their stakeholders. Um, and one example would be kind of Total, thinking about access to energy, um, to really sort of co-create solutions and reach uh, consumers that they wouldn't have, have uh, reached otherwise. So really using stakeholder input to design strategy. Um, and that's, um, I think, kind of really the focus of that section. So not just saying we better find out what our stakeholders think of us to reduce risk, but really to spot business opportunities um, and um, kind of provide commercial advantage. And then you ended with something that I thought was uh, really helpful, which is in your uh, section entitled the type of stakeholder uh, towards systems thinking. And you, and you laid out actually you diagram moving from the spoken wheel approach to systems thinking. And the diagram you had made clear two things to me immediately. One is how much more powerful systems thinking is, but two, that you're actually going to have to work at it more. But by working at it more, uh, you will, at the end of the day, have a more powerful company. Yeah, and I love the I love the idea of um, un, you know companies working to understand um, the wider kind of society um, or the and the political system that they work in. And I think this has very concrete um, consequences for how compliance and ethics officers might work because we can kind of see that doing third party due diligence, you've obviously got to do it, but it's like, is this company um, a red flag or not? End of story. Right. Um, but because what we've seen um, increasingly are kind of corruption and political risk agendas coming together, so most notably in China, but it's far from the, the only country. I think Brazil is another obvious example. It's very, very important, I think, for companies to understand corruption in the context of political risk and the wider systems and the relationships they're operating in. So it's important to understand that you're, if if your competitor is paying bribes from the point of view of your competitive position, but it's also important to understand that that competitor might be maybe linked to somebody very powerful that could do you a lot of damage. So thinking a little bit beyond the kind of background check and more about how the relationships in a system fit together, I think is really, really powerful, both from the point of view of understanding and fighting corruption, but also understanding uh, human rights impact. And then um, almost at the end, you had a section entitled The Depth of Engagement and then Actions to Deepen Internal Stakeholder Engagement Capabilities. And there you really laid out sp specific steps that uh, a leader can take to uh, not only deepen internal coordination, but also tie engagement to strategy and then develop the in an institutional capacity. And then to my utter joy, you tied it together by looking at the UK pharmaceutical company, GSK, who of course ran into uh, corruption problems in China and explained how GSK was able to move away from a, per a performance-based incentive program, which was probably part of the reason that, that led them to their corruption problem, but to put in place uh, something that aligned 
or at least encourage ethical selling behavior that puts the patient's interest first. And when you can align your customer's interest with a more ethical-based system that actually drives business, I think that's uh, really kind of the best of all worlds. Yeah, I love this GSK example as well because um, on your blog and on the FCPA blog and a lot of other places, people are more and more talking about culture and incentives and, um, you know, kind of how you show up in the market and so on as really big factors in corruption, or fighting corruption rather. And GSK has really taken this and made these incredibly bold market-moving decisions. So one of the things is it stop incentivizing its sales teams purely on how much they can sell, but also on their access to expertise and wider integrity commitments. Something else it's done based on stakeholder engagement is it stopped paying doctors to speak at conferences. And this is um, a difference in its relationship, you know, with with these doctors, it's also market moving. Like none of its peers are doing that. And I think this will over the long term have a very, very powerful impact on the pharmaceutical industry because there's very often this aren't this argument about, you know, well everyone else is doing it, so we can't change or we're going to lose business. And so GSK has has, has done something I think very, very dramatic and very bold and very impactful. And then the third thing uh, GSK has done, and I had the pleasure actually of ident of um, attending a day of this a couple of weeks ago is this really brown, groundbreaking ethics and compliance academy where they are training um, in a very involved way and not just compliance and with a wider focus on ethics and social responsibility. Large, large, large um, numbers of their team in a course that lasts a whole week and is super interactive. And so when we start to talk about kind of compliance 2.0 and kind of going beyond the process and thinking about strategy and incentives and all these good things we talk about, I think GSK is like a perfect example of what that looks like in practice. So um, I love that case study and I love the work the organi that organization is doing. And they're very modest and they know they haven't solved everything. But um, when I look at that example, I think it should be inspiring to a lot of other companies. Well, Allison, um, BSR has something quite exciting starting tomorrow, and uh, why don't you tell us about the Be Bold BR, BSR Conference 2016? Sure thing. So we have a, 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 a our annual conference coming up. So very busy week for us. We have a day of of training. I'm actually giving the human rights training tomorrow afternoon, and then we have um, two days in this conference. I have a panel called the Future of Stakeholder Engagement. Um, that has a speaker from GSK. It has a speaker from Thomson Reuters, who um, are doing some amazing stuff in the in the big data space, especially on kind of slavery and so on. I have an NY professor that's done um, a huge amount of work understanding how stakeholder engagement drives value. And then I have a speaker from Kinross Mining who's obviously very engaged at that kind of community level. So we've unfortunately only got an hour for this panel. Um, I feel like we need at least two, but just these incredibly high-level dynamic speakers, and we're going to really dig into the questions in these reports. But I would uh, be delighted if anyone listening wants to talk to me about this report more or kind of share ideas. Um, to hear from them. And, and Tom, I'm really looking forward to seeing your blogs as well. So if somebody wanted to get in touch with you, could they email you? And if so, how would they do it? They sure could. Um, the, my email address is on our website, which is bsr.org. I'm on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm Alison Taylor with one L. I'm very, very easy to find. And if you want more information on the BSR Conference 2016, go to bsr16.org. It really looks like a great event and uh, very inspiring. Well, Allison, it was really a pleasure to meet you last week. And uh, as, as, as much as a pleasure that was, it was great to visit with you today. And I look forward to continuing the conversation.